I sort of consider my specialty actually dealing with puppies um, and getting them off to the best spot, start that they possibly can. So there's quite a few things that hopefully as breeders you're already doing and if I can give you some other tips along the way that would be great because they're really really some pretty simple things you can do that are going to have a really profound influence on how these puppies develop behavior wise um, and really the goal is for them to be successes and that will reflect well on you as well as giving them a wonderful life. So there are a number of things that I have people come to me for help with that I see over and over again and not everything's preventable but some of them certainly um, are and the earlier you start of course the better chances are of preventing bad habits from developing or um, problem behaviors. So uh, some of the things that I see uh, coming through my door so to speak, um, probably the, the biggest issues um, that are most pro problematic from treating it as a behavioral problem are the fear related issues. So fear of people. If they're going to be afraid of people, usually it's going to be men and or children. So um, an example, sort of the cases in the extreme, I've had a number of cases over the years where people have... This clicker controls the lighting, although I don't know how. Oh, okay. <laughs> I can try it. You know, always good experimenting. No? I don't seem to be doing anything with this. Okay, I'm going to keep going. So, um, oh, there we go. Great. That looks better. Yay. <laughs> Technicalities. All right, so um, I can think of a, a few cases over the years, and again, these are this is kind of the extreme, but um, as I said, usually if dogs are going to be afraid of anybody, they're going to be afraid of men. And there have, I've had a few clients who've called me for help because they bring a dog into the house. It's usually a, an adult dog or, or adolescent dog. And the poor husband not only can't interact with the dog, can't touch the dog. The dog runs whenever the husband comes into the room. And the first thing that people think comes to mind is, oh, the dog has been abused. That may be the case some of the time, but it's not all the time. A lot of times that's due to a lack of early socialization. Um, and, you know, a less extreme case, they're just not comfortable. Somebody's out walking their dog, and this nice guy comes up to pet the dog, and the dog snaps at him. Um, so, a, large majority of the aggression cases that I come across are actually fear-based problems. So anything we can do to raise confident puppies is going to help with that. Another one is fear of kids. Um, sometimes same sorts of scenarios. Most often though, um, you know, it's somewhat manageable if it's a dog that's in an you know, adult home and it just doesn't like kids and the owners can keep it away from kids. Um, but if that goes wrong, it can cause a big problem, um, whether it's they can't feel safe taking their dog out for a walk because kids can come running up to see the cute dog. Um, sometimes people who don't think they're going to have children in the home end up having children in the home. Um, and so, you know, it's a choice between the baby and the dog. Usually the dog loses. Um, and from my own personal history, when I was a kid we had a German Shepherd um, who was great with the family. I was about five at the time when we got him, five or six. Loved the dog. Couldn't, did great with all of us kids, but anybody else couldn't come near him or near the house. And he actually bit one of my uh, school friends um, who many years later turns out 
we went to the same high school and went to the 20th year reunion and she said, I mean, she said you know, I still have that scar from your dog. <laughs> and the dog unfortunately had to be put to sleep. So again, you're trying to avoid the worst case scenarios. Um, I would say my class sizes when I do classes are typically about six dogs, six to eight dogs maximum. Um, and I would say in general I have one dog in every class that shows some fearfulness towards strangers and or dogs. So it's not an uncommon problem. And I'm talking about both puppies and in adult classes. Um, other things that I come across quite often, especially in the uh, younger dogs, but not exclusively, is sort of the, the unruly behaviors. You know, biting in a jumping, barking, things they're trying to get attention from owners. Um, those are less likely to be uh, you know, the sort of thing that causes a dog to lose its home, but it, it does happen, especially if uh, you know somebody is, is just not able to do a good job with training and or have somebody who's too frail to, to manage that. Um, other sort of destructive behaviors, you probably can think of many more, um, but things like counter surfing. And I actually, uh, this past year, you know how things sort of coincidences add up. I had two uh, home visits in one day, which uh, both places I went to, and I came in the door, and you know, I had come, I, I actually can't even remember now what the original reason why they wanted me to come, but oh, come in the door and it's like, wow, this is a suspiciously empty, clean house. Turns out both cases um, were dogs that not only would counter surf, steal food off the counter or the table, but would also take anything that was not nailed down. So there were, there was literally, there's nothing on the coffee table, there's no cushions on the sofas, there is nothing. And unfortunately, um, that was a case of misguided training. Both um, owners had been to trainers in the past who had told them that if your puppy steals something, go give, get a treat and give them a treat to get the item back. So they unintentionally taught their dogs to steal. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but even if you don't do that, you can have some, some, you know, people aren't very happy about having a dog that, you know, they can't have in the house with them and have uh, to worry about making sure the butter is put away every single time. Um, in fact, I also, my sister had a dog, and this was a rescue dog, that actually could open the refrigerator. And if you forgot to bungee the refrigerator shut, the dog would be helping itself, and then, of course, getting violently ill from eating all the things it should eat. So, um, probably the most common issue people need help with that I see um, is pulling on the leash, and that isn't always a big deal. Um, if you've got a papillon pulling on the leash, it's still kind of manageable. It's probably not the greatest for the dog, but. Um, it doesn't take a very big dog to start cause problems if they're constantly pulling on that leash. And it's something that, <clears throat> excuse me, even by the time they come into the first puppy class has usually already become a problem. Uh, separation anxiety. I, I hate that one. <laughs> That's really, really hard to treat successfully. Um, and uh, and that kind of goes along with all the other fear behaviors. So um, those are tough ones. And <clears throat> housebreaking issues, uh, generally I don't see that too much in older dogs, but certainly sometimes in the, in the puppies it goes on longer than it should. So, um, you know, this is kind of just a smattering, but I'd say those are the things that I see most often. And believe it or not, a lot of those issues start forming as problems even when they're still uh, very young puppies, right around the age they're going home or even sooner. So 
whether the dogs are given up, given back to breeders, going to shelters, whatever, that's usually, it's more often due to the dog's behavioral problems than any other reason. So anything we can do to help that is gonna be a, a bonus. So the question that comes up all the time is, is it nature or nurture? Are these problems because you get a dog that is uh, by nature more prone to being a troublemaker? Or is it something that can be due to environmental influences and things that we as humans are doing in particular to help or hurt this dog? So the answer is, of course, it's both. So um, I'm sure you can probably think of examples of, of uh, both types of explanations. Um, I came across, uh, I think it was like a last year's National Geographic article just before I was leaving that I think is an excellent example of why nature is such a strong influence. Um, and it's the, you may have seen the studies before of the uh, fox breeding in uh, Russia, Siberia, and how in very few generations they go from a, they can breed for tameness, and they go from basically a animal that can't be handled to one that is behaving like a pet dog. And interestingly enough, also has a lot of the physical characteristics that changes along with that. So clearly, there are components of temperament that are going to be transmissible um, genetically. We haven't really isolated those influences so far, but maybe we will at some point. But so when I say nature, for the purposes of this audience, we're really talking about breeding. So anything that you can do to breed for a good temperament, do it, because that is really what's gonna to lead to success. Because I don't care if you're planning to show your dog, you're sending it to a working home, you're um, gonna sell, sell it to a pet home, you still want a good temperament. That's gonna be the, uh, the best dog. So, um, in general, you kinda of wanna go, uh, try and avoid the behavioral extremes. Um, most importantly, probably the most obvious ones are particularly timid dogs or dogs that are leaning towards the aggressive tendencies. And just as a side note on that, I think it's um, human nature oftentimes to um, try and, in trying to understand why a problem is happening. Sometimes those get turned into excuses and my preference would be, of course, coming from the behavioral side of things, is if you have any doubt about a dog's temperament, if you think if there is an, an incidence of aggression, I've done it, with, I'm, probably everybody else has done it, where you think, oh, okay, well, that was because of, the, you know, it was that other dog or it was blah, 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 blah. Nine times out of ten, we find out as time goes on that's not true, that really the incidences start to pile up. So when in doubt, err on the side of, uh, of caution as far as that goes. Um, the other uh, caution I would give is uh, in terms of breeding uh, high drive dogs, dogs who you know, by breed or by selection are just not gonna quit. Um, they make great working dogs, but it's hard to live with those dogs and realize that the majority of pet homes are not going to be able to do well with that type of dog. So really be careful about uh, making sure they're going to the right homes if that's, those are the breeds you're, you're working with. So the rest is what I'm going to talk about is more my specialty, which is the nurture part. So these are ways that we can... Uh, influence their development. And as, uh, as they're developing, as early as three weeks, probably even earlier, 
but certainly by about three weeks of old age, they need to be starting to be socialized. And, um, you know, when in doubt, again, sooner rather than later, start handling the puppies right away, so forth. So I'm gonna go through some of the specific things that you can do as far as that early socialization while they're still with the breeder. Let's see. So, um, the other reason I wanted, to, or the other thing I wanted to mention before I go to that is, you as breeders, you're the experts, really. And the puppies who are going to their new homes are probably going to people who are not quite as savvy about dog behavior as you are. So any problems that you see coming up, anything you can do is just gonna put those puppies that much further ahead of the game in terms of being successful. So hopefully I'm preaching to the choir on this one. Okay, so you want to get your puppies to meet some nice men. And um, I'm particularly fond of that one, but um, that's another story. You want them, uh, all of these things I'm talking about, of course you want them to be positive experiences. Okay, So they need to gain that confidence that these tall creatures with deeper voices are really nice people. Um, and also some nice children. If you can manage to pull that off, that's great. <laughs> And um, especially children and dogs who are both willing to share is nice. Um, so uh, this is actually my my grandniece who uh, and my dog who was my dog adores children. Um, and my niece was a little intimidated, as you can probably imagine, by the size difference between dog and child. But all it took was a wading pool and some water, and there everything was cool. So. Um, again, with kids, you want it to be positive, so they need to be, um, you know, probably start with slightly older children and, you know, <laughs> get them comfortable with that. And a great way to get, if you don't, you know, have, my, my grandniece is in, lives in Seattle, I live in Portland, Oregon, so I don't get to see her very often. Um, but if, you know, you can have what, Ian Dunbar calls a puppy party, invite some people over, you know, if they have some friends or whatever. And if all else fails, um, it probably wouldn't hurt to have the um, television going on some children's programming so the dogs get used to that, you know, sound of the high-pitched voices and the, you know, all the things that children do that are so different from what adults do. Hey, um, that actually is a Siberian Husky. I know it's not the best angle, but um, <laughs> so uh, I do uh, um, a little bit of uh, dog sledding and ski touring and get together with a group of friends every winter and we go up and spend a weekend um, hanging out with friends and a lot of northern breed dogs. Um, so. This friend actually had a, a litter of puppies and she brought them in and was trimming nails and that's one of the things you want to get them used to is not only ha having things done to them but you know the restraint that's involved. Um, and again, make it a positive experience. So not only did the puppy have friends around to entertain it, she also had a, something to chew on, keep them distracted. So. Um, anything along those lines will be helpful. You want to get them used to being in a crate and comfortable with that. So even early on, you can just leave a crate with the door open for them. Um, that again is my, my dog Willow when she was a bit younger and smaller. Um, so initially I would just leave the, leave the crate in there, leave the door open. You don't have to worry about, about confining them necessarily. Um, but that's an important one. One, one of the things that um, often happens, or I get questions about people want to crate train their puppies, but oh no, the puppy screams and cries when you put them in the crate. And then, so they open the door because they think something's wrong or they think the puppy has to go out. And pretty soon, again, the puppy has then trained them to open the door when it cries and they can't use the crate because the puppy's screaming. So, uh, 
my puppy, Willow, when I got her, um, I have to hand it to her breeder. She's actually, the breeder's one, one of the ones that helped inspire this uh, talk because of all the dogs that I've had, this puppy came to me. She was amazing. I mean, she didn't bite, she didn't jump. When I had her in the house, she was a house dog. Right from nine weeks old when I got her, she never destroyed anything. She would, you could tell, she'd get the look in her eye, she'd go and she'd find a toy. Um, however, the crate, even though I know that as a fact that the breeder did do a little bit of uh, time in the crate for the puppies, the first night I picked her up and uh, I had to go up to Seattle to get her, so I stayed with my sister and my, my parents came along because they wanted to see the puppies. And uh, unbeknownst to me, we pick up the puppy, we come back to my sister's house and she th decided to have a surprise birthday party for my parents. So probably not the most <laughs> ideal situation to bring a new puppy in. She did fine, except when we sat down to dinner, so I you know, gave her her little bowl of food and she had her dinner and I put her in a crate and I shut the door and she started screaming bloody murder for 10 minutes while we're trying to eat dinner at this birthday party. And I kept saying, I'm really sorry, but I can't open the crate. <laughs> she finally fell asleep, opened the crate, and it, that was it. That was the only time she ever did that. But I can just imagine, you know, a novice owner was like, oh my God, the poor puppy, it's dying. So they let him out. So also, they, uh, you want to start having them meet new dogs other than just mom um, and ideally dogs of different breeds and sizes and shapes so that those become familiar animals. Um, one of the ways I sort of explain it to uh, the pet owning public is if they don't get that exposure during the critical periods of socialization they'll look at other dogs and it's almost like they're, it's an alien. They don't know what, what it is. So the more experience you can give them, the better. But of course you want to make sure it's safe. So um, this was actually a uh, long story, but Labradoodle puppy that uh, I was working with over a weekend. And I fortunately had my dog who was a great dog for her to meet and didn't mind having the puppy climb all over her. And again, if possible, introduce them to other animals that they are likely to encounter. And I suspect that will vary depending on where you live and where the puppies are going to. Um, Willow was exposed to cats and to horses. Um, in fact, they lived with cats. They played, the puppies were playing with cats when I picked her up, um, but hasn't had direct contact since. And there was a gap between when I picked her up at nine weeks and the next time she saw a horse was probably about five months old and she was scared of the horse. So, you know, it, to illustrate it needs ongoing um, exposure for that to, to stick. Um, one of the other ones that I've been getting more question, or questions about lately has been chickens because backyard chicken raising is becoming more popular in, in Oregon. So, of course, you know, if you don't have a horse handy or chickens, it's going to be kind of hard. But the more that you can uh, provide that exposure, the better. Riding in the car, car sickness is potentially, um, can really make life challenging, especially because that's also going to affect how much owners are going to socialize their dogs if every time they put them in the car they're puking. Um, and it's not clear whether early experience with riding in the car is really going to um, affect that. I actually um, am hoping to do some, uh, some tests of that with a, a couple of breeders. However, certainly if the first time they go in a car is to leave their litter and or to go to the vet, that's probably not a good first experience for riding in the car. So even if you're just, you know, put them in the car, back them out, turn around, come back in, do that a couple of times before you send them home. 
um, or feed them in the car or feed them directly after they get back from a ride in the car. Anything along those lines will help. Uh, and um, unlike Kobe, who is my boyfriend's dog, who got to ride shotgun, um, except when I got in the car, uh, I highly recommend doing it in a crate, getting them used to riding in a crate. And I recommend that for new owners as well. Um, even if later on you want to let them ride, you know, in a seat with a seatbelt or whatever. It's really nice having them start in the crate, then they're comfortable with that. And, you know, my dogs have always been, when I've had them ride loose, they're like, oh, okay, well, I'm in the car, I just lie down. And that's what they do, so that makes life easy. So another new experience I would encourage is getting them to explore new places. Um, and when I say new places, it doesn't necessarily have to be some other location. It can be new places around your house or your property, but it's that repeated exposure to new things, getting them used to um, how do you handle a new situation that's important. So to uh, kind of sum up the things you can do to socialize them early on, this is, we're really talking especially between about ages three to eight weeks of age. Um, the more positive experiences you can give them, the better. Um, and so we're talking about men, children, and other people. Uh, getting them used to restraint, handling, grooming, uh, normal household activities, and noises. That's a big one, if, especially if your puppies are being raised uh, in a kennel outside of a home. They need to spend some time in the home as well. So bring them in, you know, one or two at a time, have them hang out so that they get used to all the goings on of a normal home because that may be a scary experience when they first go to their, their uh, new owners. Expose them to other animals as much as possible. Um, <coughs> Expose them to crates, kennels, and gates, and I'll give you a little tip that I just sort of happened on out of uh, my own sheer laziness, and that is uh, I unintentionally taught the last couple of my dogs that putting a baby gate across, you don't mess with a baby gate. And the reason they learned that is because I was lazy and going in and out with this baby gate, you know, and all that. So a couple of times I had just leaned it up against the wall while I went in really quickly. Puppy went up and, you know, kind of touched it and went <laughs> My dogs have never jumped up on gates. They respect gates. They don't, they could easily go over them, but they don't. And so, you know, just that one, ex one time I did that and I felt bad at the time and afterwards I was like, hey, you know, <laughs> Maybe that wasn't such a bad thing. Um, because that is a problem I also get sometimes, is that dogs will go over the gates. Uh, riding in the car, exploring new places. And if uh, you want more details on those uh, critical periods, um, Dr. Karen Overall has a really good overview in her book, Clinical Behavioral Medicine for Small Animals. I've also put uh, on some of the tables, we had a couple of handouts, and there's one there um, by Ian Dunbar that uh, gives a, a bit of an overview about socializing and, and the different critical periods. It's not nearly as detailed as uh, Karen overall, so. Okay, so in addition to socializing, there's some things you can actively do to, to shape behavior that um, I'm sure new owners would really appreciate having that head start. So one of the things that um, is fairly easy to do right from the beginning is just discourage jumping. And all you gotta do is give them the cold shoulder. Um, Kobe, my, my boyfriend's dog, um, when we started going out, Kobe was, I think, 12, and my dog Willow was six months old. Kobe was not interested in playing with Willow. And you can imagine, super, well, I wanna play with everybody. And one thing that Kobe taught me was the look. 
and he would just, and she said, and she totally respected that. So, um, you know, the cold shoulder works really well for jumping. They jump up on you, just, no. but for sure, make sure nobody's reaching down and going, oh, you're such a cute puppy. And I know they're adorable, and you want to do that. But if you can avoid that, it will just make life much easier as they get bigger. Um, yeah, so we want to encourage them to chew on toys. Um, as I said, Willow was came to, I take no responsibility for that. She came to me great. She didn't, I mean, I, rugs, no problem, towels on the floor, shoes. She didn't touch any of it. It was great. Um, Onyx, however, one of my favorite dogs. Um, Onyx grew up with a blanket in the crate because, you know, Dobermans tend to be kind of cold, especially uh, in northern climates. And so she developed a passion for chewing on blankets, and that went on her entire life. So, um, also, another thing that was really interesting with Willow, noticing um, she came, came with this habit, I don't know if... <coughs> She, she, how she picked it up, but uh, you know, you could see she'd get that look in her eye and she's like, I just want to bite something. And she'd either bite her toy or she'd bite herself. That was kind of cute. <laughs> but so we want them obviously not to be biting people, so you want to discourage that as much as you can. And the leash, as I mentioned before, that's a big, um, a big issue for people. And it, it really does have long reaching consequences. Um, in fact, uh, the other day I had the plumber over to look at something and he said, I've really got to talk to you about my dog. And he's like, apparently it's a fairly, I've never met it, but it's a medium sized dog. And he says, I can't walk it anymore. He just pull, I put a pinch collar on it, I've tried this, I've tried that, and this dog just pulls so hard I can't walk it. So the dog doesn't get to go out anymore. So things we can do to help with that. Um, you know, when you first put a leash on a, or a collar on a puppy, um, in my experience, actually, the first time all of my dogs had a collar on was when I went to pick them up. And uh, the collar's not so bad, you know, a little scratch at it and so forth. But they, they adjust to that relatively quickly. But the first time you put a leash on a puppy, what does it do? So, oh my God. And it's backing, backing, and so if the first time that happens is with the new owner, what does the new owner do? He goes, oh, I'm sorry. And it, puppy pulls, owner goes towards the puppy. The other thing that happens is taking the puppy out to go on a potty break. What happens? You're so focused on getting the puppy to go to the bathroom and the owner is walking around following the puppy around. So in no time at all, the puppy has learned that pull on the leash, that's how you get the person to move. When actually, we want them to learn the reverse. We want the puppy to learn that when they feel tension on the leash, that they need to actually move towards the person to reduce the tension. And that the leash doesn't work if it's tight. So, you know, I'm not suggesting that you teach puppies how to heal before they go to a new home. But if nothing else, if they can spend a couple of short periods where they are on a leash and on a tie out, where something that's fixed, where if they pull against it, it's not going to move, that's going to be a big head start for them. Um, you know, ideally, want to take it to the next step where they start to learn that you know they want to move with the person and so forth but again that's that's icing on the cake as far as I'm concerned um, but that basic concept of they feel tension you move towards the person that's that's what would be wonderful if they could go home with that okay. because if you don't I would show you what the other possible outcome is. Oh. This. And it
it's great when they pull in harness. It sucks if they pull that hard on a leash. <laughs> um, I actually, uh, a friend of mine was in the Iditarod and I got to go up one year and um, volunteer and help at the start and so forth. And I'm used to Malamutes. They're, you know, 75, 80 pounds. And he's got the little Alaskan Huskies that, you know, maybe they're 40, 45 pounds. And I'm also used to, you know, I mean, I'm fairly strong and I can used to handling even bigger dogs. Unbelievable how strong those little Huskies were. I, it, it, we had one person per dog walking them up to the starting line, plus two sleds, four people, and 12 dogs. And they were dragging handlers through the snow. I mean, you had people falling down. So <laughs> it's, it's pretty impressive, I must say. So food, that was also one of the, one of the issues that uh, I wished Willow came with some better, uh, uh, better experiences. Um, because every time I came near her, if she had food in her bowl, I mean, she already ate fast, but it was like, okay. And so anything you can do to help stave off possessiveness would be great. That might mean as they're getting weaned, um, feed the puppies separately, far enough away that they're not, you know, having another puppy running in and stealing the end of the meal. Or if you can feed ad lib where the food isn't running out, or if you can come and just add a little bit more food here and there. So instead of putting in, you know, three cups of food, you put in one cup, and then just before it runs out, you put in another cup, and so on. That way they're associating people, especially, but movement towards them as a positive and not like, oh my God, I gotta eat it before it's gone. Also, you, the uh, ideal is to start teaching them where to go. And puppies actually develop a substrate preference quite early, even by about age eight and a half weeks old. Um, so you want to think about what's going to be working for them. Willow's substrate, substrate preference was for grass, which um, in some ways was OK. I just assume not have a lawn with yellow spots, but you know that's all right. Um, but that's the only until she was probably a year old that she would not go anywhere else. So when I was out with her somewhere and there wasn't any grass, that's a bit of a problem. Um, so service dogs have to be able to go anytime, anywhere. So pavement, um, gravel. Wood chips, bark dust, think about the places that dogs may be um, asked to, to go and uh, try and, and give them incentive to use those areas. And of course, the other side of the coin is you don't want them to develop a preference for carpet. So, so uh, other things you can do, um, try and get them started on as they get older and closer to going home, spending some uh, time in the crate on their own with the door shut now. Give them something great to chew on, a calm, stuffed calm or something, um, so that they're spending some short periods um, being isolated and getting them used to that. Discouraging jumping and biting, destructive chewing, uh, poss possessiveness, uh, and especially food aggression, substrate, substrate preferences, and introducing leash and collar. All things that hopefully you can get them going on. Any puppies that are kind of, you notice are more of the behavioral extremes, so I'm thinking especially the timid ones or the really high drive ones, they probably would really benefit from extra attention from you. Um, and you know, let the owners know they're going to have to focus on some um, extra socializing for the timid puppies, for example. So when should they go to their new homes? Based on the research on critical periods, age between ages 
eight to 12 weeks is probably ideal because those are times when they're um, really forming social bonds and it's also probably prime time for housebreaking. Unfortunately, um, that also coincides with a fear period where they are gonna be more sensitive to anything scary. And so potentially something that frightens them in that period could end up being a lifelong phobia. So if you're talking about shipping a puppy, you gotta be careful about doing it during that time period. Also, um, litter mates. I periodically run across people that, oh, I want, I've got to have two, they've got to have someone to play with. And it, this may be a, a personal bias, but in my ex experience, it doesn't work out that well. Um, they're harder to train. Um, they tend to be very codependent. Um, they don't tend, and so they don't tend to socialize as well, both with people and with other dogs, especially. Um, so I really try to try to discourage that when I can. Um, and being realistic about the homes you're sending them to, small children under the age of five dealing with a puppy. Um, if you've got a puppy that's prone to jumping and biting, that's going to be a, a big challenge. Um, or you know, older adults who are not um, as physically able to manage um, dealing with that. Also, I would encourage you strongly to stay in touch with the uh, new owners and track those health and behavior problems because hopefully that will then influence your future choice of breeding. And as I said, you guys are going to be the first experts that most new owners will turn to for information. So um, hopefully you can start them off on the right foot. Um, Ian Dunbar's two books, uh, Before You Get Your Puppy and After You Get Your Puppy, are now available as free downloads on Dogstar Daily, which is just dogstardaily.com. So that's a great resource to start with. And the things that, if I could put it down in one nutshell, <laughs> it, that I think is most important for new owners to know is supervise. A lot of times people start giving puppies too much freedom too soon and they discover that, oh, I can reach the sandwich on the counter or I go behind the sofa, I can pee and nobody will notice. And then, you know, you're dealing with a, a bad habit which is much harder to to prevent, so I always say being stricter early on lets the puppies have, or as they become adults, they get to have great freedom. Um, my dog uh, has run of the house. Um, for the last year, we have not had a kitchen. Um, we have a sink, a toaster oven, microwave, and a bookshelf that has our food on it. And the bookshelf is, you know, lower, lower than the table. And she hasn't run out of the house. It's not a problem. So um, getting them off to a good start. The other one that I hear a lot is, oh, well, it's a puppy. They'll outgrow that, right? They outgrow it if they're trained along with it. But they're not going to just outgrow it on their own. Um, the worst example of that was somebody called me when the dog was six years old for help on uh, teaching them not to pull on the leash, and somebody had told her that, oh, she would outgrow it. How long are you going to wait? <laughs> um, so also, I recommend signing up for obedience classes or confirmation classes or anything along those lines right away. The best classes are likely to fill up early, so if they don't sign up right when they get the puppy, the puppy may be five or six months old before they can get in. Um, and you can start Soon as soon as they get home, um, and socialization—that's the other one that you know. You get them off to a good start. It has to be maintained. If they're not getting that uh, socialization, that first uh, month or so when they get home, it's really critical. But then ongoing beyond that, uh, you know, that's something that they really can't recover from. If they don't get that. 
um, and they develop a fear of other dogs. But the best that you know, I tell people they can hope for is that they will tolerate, but they're never really going to enjoy other dogs. So, uh, again, keeping the socializing, can I say socializing some more? Um, one of the other things that I have uh, happen fairly regularly is people who will get an older dog, six months old or a year old, that they've gotten from a breeder because the breeder was keeping it for showing and then decided not to keep it. And it turns out then um, the puppy has not been socialized and it comes, and it comes into the, the building. The first thing it does is, oh. <laughs> and then, you know, it doesn't want it interact with other dogs and so forth. So you got to keep it up. One of the ways that um, I took a, a page out of Ian Dunbar's book, so to speak, um, and several years ago started doing what we call a puppy romp. So every Sunday we have an hour social hour for puppies under six months. And it has turned out to be a huge success. Um, last week I think was actually our record attendance. We had 28 puppies. And again, every week, almost without fail, we have one or two puppies that come in that are four and a half, five months old, who are terrified. So they didn't get that early socialization, and it really shows. One of the other benefits is it's great entertainment, so people bring their kids, so the kid, puppies get exposure to kids. So here's one of those puppies that came in at five months old, a little cavalier puppy, and he was terrified. And the Las Apso had been coming since she was at least three months old, and she's got really good social skills, and she was trying to make friends with him. She'd lie down, and it didn't work. So I've actually hopefully got some video clips to show you from the same session of Puppy Romp. So this is a, a yellow lab puppy, nine weeks old, Right when it first got on the floor, and where's my cursor? Here we go. Okay. So it's playing kind of you're getting the slow mo version here. So this puppy's a little bit unsure, but not too bad. And, whoops, that's the next same one. Okay. Um, so, hey, sick, missing. He had a word here. Oh, well. So, the Black Labradoodle is actually uh, in a service dog program for Angel Service Dogs, which does allergy detection um, training for these dogs. And this is actually comes from a puppy raiser. This is his fourth puppy he's raised. And he knew better, and he says he knew better. Uh, he waited too long to start socializing, and so he took this puppy to the dog park, and it, of course, was completely overrun by the other dogs and terrified. And so this is the second time he's been to our puppy romp. And now you can see the little yellow lab is the one who's the meter and greeter. And see some more interaction here. And the Labradoodle is actually doing way better than it uh, was the first visit. The first visit just stayed under a chair the whole time. And just by contrast, here's some normal puppy play. I divide the groups by roughly by age size and so we kind of have the older rowdy group and the smaller shy group so this is the again it's kind of slow motion but you get the sense of they're all just hanging out and running around and wrestling and everything so um unfortunately even when people will repeatedly bring these dogs into puppy romp um, sometimes after like three or four weeks they will start to emerge a little bit um, but 
the, depending on when they come in and depending on the breed and other things, there are quite a few that just never recover from that lack of early exposure. And so, you know, maybe you're thinking, well, who cares if it can't play with other dogs? But what that translates to in an adult dog is it can't, it may not be able to walk them because every time they see a dog, they start barking and lunging and look horribly aggressive can't take them to a daycare, so that rules out people that need to um, be able to take advantage of that if they're working. So if you can get them off to the right start, you can have a wonderful dog. You can take anywhere, you can do anything with them, um, and they're going to have, hopefully, a very successful life. So I want to thank uh, Schroeder's Den, which is the daycare that I teach classes at in Hillsboro, Oregon. A lot of trainers that have influenced me over the years, but uh, particular on this subject, I would say Karen Overall and Ian Dunbar. Uh, Dorit Evenson is the breeder of Willow, who really showed me how much a breeder could do with a puppy. Kim Pete uh, is the uh, owner of uh, Clara Ridge Labradoodles, and she has been involved in breeding for the Angel Dog Service Program. Association of Pet Dog Trainers, as I mentioned, that may be a good resource for uh, referrals for trainers if you need it. And um, certainly the thousands of dogs and their owners that I've had the pleasure of teaching, and I've also learned a lot from them over the years, including Ken, who's sitting in the back, was actually a student of mine with his dog. And certainly NIA and Patty and Ken Strand, both for inviting me, and Rob, wherever he is, who saved me with the uh, helping with the slideshow this morning. And last but not least, some of my best friends. So um, one thing I just realized I forgot to mention, the big uh, debate that has been a real uh, problem in the past has been we've got this conflict between the age of socializing and when the vaccinations are, are done. And I still get a lot of people who come in who say, oh, well, I had to wait till they've had all their vaccinations. The, um, I'm going to make sure I say this right, the American Veterinary Society of Animal Behavior, I think that's what it is, um, there's also one of their handouts on it. Um, they, among many others, are now promoting socializing before the final set of vaccinations. So that's one of the reasons we did the puppy romp was to have a safe, sanitary place that they can socialize puppies. In the 16 years that I've been um, doing classes in the past, I don't know, probably six years we've been doing puppy romp, I have never had any dog that has had um, any of the diseases we vaccinate against. Um, and they, in fact, I've never had a dog that's had a life-threatening communicable disease. So I'm not saying the risk isn't there, but you have to balance that with the risk of a, of a dog with behavior problems. So you do it, do the best you can to give them that safe but positive start. Um, thank you very much. If anyone have questions?